Well, a very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this music talk from the Laidlaw Music Centre of the University of St Andrews. This is the second of a pair of music talks. Uh, this week we are discussing playing online, and last week we discussed singing online. To give us something of an introduction to this week, I thought I could recap some of the main points that we covered last week in uh, singing online. Last week we dis discussed the advantages and challenges of teaching um, singing online, and we touched a little bit on the platforms which enable that to happen. One of the things we're going to be talking more about this week is uh, teaching and also the use of technology. Last week we spoke about web streaming of live broadcasts and the effect that distant, uh, distant audiences have on performers. And we uh, thought about, in a philosophical sense almost, the incomplete transaction, as one panellist last week um, put on it, when the communicative chain in from uh, composer to performer to audience has this rupture, if you like, with um, live streaming. We also discussed last week virtual performances and we considered these to be those performances that we're now seeing everywhere where people have recorded themselves and then they're all put together. And we, we, we agreed, I think, widely that though these are a great thing, that they're actually closer to theatre or fantasy than any mode of performance that we've had in classical music at least um, before. But interestingly, one of the panellists last week considered that when doing virtual performances, if you make that virtual performance with a group of musicians that you know from real life, so to say, that uh, you can actually, from an audialization in your ear, consider what other performers might be doing around you, even though you are performing yourself in isolation. Lastly, we also touched on the future of work for professionals and whether uh, live streaming and the new rules of engagement for music making that have emerged uh, in 2020 so far may have an impact on the way in which you know, the professional world of music works um, from international competition and the effect that that might have on local opportunities. But all panellists last week, as I'm sure this week, spoke um, about a need to do all that we can online uh, so that musicians, uh, performers, teachers are fighting fit for when we come to the world of music as we know it will return and also that those whom we are teaching, those whom are in music education do not miss out on really what would essentially be a large chunk of their development. So, on to our panellists this week, I'm delighted to welcome Ashling Agnew, our Associate Teacher of Flute, who is uh, a very experienced performer, uh, very well known to Scottish audiences and internationally. Uh, Eva Wardlow, her student uh, and a medical student at St Andrews. John Wallace, our Honorary Professor of Brass, uh, who also joins us today in his role as the Chairperson of the Music Education Partnership Group. Alan Thompson, our Head of Outreach at the Music Centre, and Jonathan Kemp, our Head of Music Technology. Welcome to you all and thank you very much for being with us. Ashling, I'm going to start with you if I may. Uh, it's been a long time since I've caught up with you and um, tell us all about what you've been doing online, you know, uh, whatever that may be and what you uh, has, has been most effective. Okay, well, I suppose I'll divide what I've been doing into the two main categories, performance and teaching. Um, performance, there hasn't been nearly as much as what there normally is. Obviously, uh, most things have been cancelled. I've been trying to fulfil some projects I was supposed to be working on by doing what you were talking about before and patching things together with other musicians remotely uh, and recording from home, which is something but it's quite uh what would i say frustrating or feels like a bit of a compromise to what i would normally be able to achieve um so at least it is something it's a reason to keep playing and practicing and sharing material but it doesn't feel um anywhere near what the what the norm would be for me uh, on the teaching side of things i've been quite busy actually so and that kind of follows 
three different strands, if you like. So from individual lessons that I'd normally be given, and they're obviously all taking place online, so via Zoom. And then I've branched recently into doing some more group rehearsals. So where I'd normally run flute choirs, um, both at the university and outside, I've been using those um, times to do like sort of workshop masterclass type um, online calls um, and forming smaller ensembles within that because the larger ensemble isn't really possible. I have tried, um, but it didn't feel entirely satisfying for anybody. So really using those as sort of smaller opportunities to play and opportunities to share different things with people in a workshop setting. And then the third thing is really uh, pre-recording videos. So I've done quite a few video workshops uh, with an educational sort of stream. So there's some of them have been like uh, like music lectures. So, you know, delivering to a slightly um, higher level, I suppose, but with fairly broad outlook. And other ones I've been doing for younger kids that should ordinarily be learning in school and aren't able to at the moment. So with those, I've been trying to incorporate um, some practical elements, so getting them to develop rhythm and listen to music in different ways. Um, and within that, there isn't really a possibility for interaction, so they don't have the facility to have a, a back and forth Zoom. So that's kind of pre-recording those and trying to manufacture that interaction whilst not actually being there. Um, so that's kind of what I've been mainly doing. And um, I, I remember when we did catch up a, a couple of weeks ago over email when you were talking about running your um, online flute groups that you uh, said that for some people, um, of maybe perhaps the community musicians that you work with, that this type of playing has been really valuable for them. Could you say anything more about that, about the way in which you think those, um, the, you have been, have been reaching those people and the effect of them and perhaps the way that those pre-recorded videos have been received? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've always felt that um, flute ensembles and things like that that we run are a really important thing for people in the community. Obviously, some of our flautists, uh, like Eva, get really involved in the orchestras and chamber ensembles, so they have a lot of different outlets for playing. But for a lot of community musicians, that really is their only thing to do. Uh, it's their thing to look forward to and to play with other people. And I suppose given the, the popularity of the instrument, there isn't enough space for flute players and orchestras all over the place. So we have quite a lot of um, players that play a good level and have no other outlet for, for music making. Um, and I suppose it's, you know, obviously it's a social thing and it's a way of sharing music and it's a way of developing their playing outside of actually taking lessons and playing solo. So I think it's quite an important thing. I think what happened in the first lockdown, I noticed with my groups is that there was a fair bit of despondency um, and people just, I mean, amongst everybody, not just amateur music makers, I mean, myself included, sort of felt like, what's the point? Why do something substandard? And then I think, you know, a lot of us recognised that the toll that that was taken on mental health, apart from anything else, and on our playing and the missed opportunities. And I think I've sensed quite a lot of um, enthusiasm for doing it again so there, there's been as soon as I mentioned to people the possibility of trying something you know they were just straight in like absolutely I've been desperate for something um so I've, I've kind of tried to hone what I'm doing in it to, to change it up a wee bit because it doesn't function like a normal rehearsal anymore and like I said I'm trying to use workshop skills to sort of like just get people playing and thinking about how they're practicing and get them engaged with the instrument again and you know, I suppose just being a wee bit more open myself about how I find the process and what I do in my practice instead of just running a rehearsal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that certainly resonates with um, something that Megan Reed said last week about teaching online that, you know, one way to conceive of the teacher is that as a, as, as a guide. And so, you know, if you have an interaction with someone, you know, one positive outcome can be a setting, setting them goals and, and things to work on. But for, for you, Eva, how has it been on the on the receiving end of, of lessons online of, of, of these ensembles and, and and Yeah, so it's kind of like what Ashley said, it's a bit of a, a bit of a change. And initially I think I wasn't I wasn't skeptical, but I was a bit kind of wondering how you know more like nuances were gonna translate across screens. And especially I had a few lessons back really kind of at the start of lockdown. Um 
just as the uni had been let off and I'd gone back home and I've had a few since I've come back now and especially at the start I was wondering how it would all work with being able to improve my technique when someone's not standing when I don't have Ashleen standing there to tell me you're not holding the foot the right way or <laughs> I'm just doing something quite fundamentally wrong that's harder to see maybe over the screen but I think it's actually been working really well it's surprising how much the audio can actually pick up when you kind of like fiddle with the settings a little bit um and it's been very like the lessons have still been very beneficial um i haven't noticed that you know i've not been getting as much out of them or anything and it's really nice to still have a bit of structure as well mm -hmm. that's one of the the big things that you know i would have had something on every night of the week normally um at university involved in music but no, I'm kind of like stuck in my room a lot of the time and there's nothing really as structured, but it's a real highlight to be able to know every week I'm going to have a lesson with Ashleen and it's something to think about and kind of work towards and know I can practice during the week, I can set some days that I can go to the music centre, which is great as well to be able to have access to such nice facilities and just get out have a bit of a walk on the way there have some really nice time just playing and getting out of my room and then i know that i'm going to be able to see ashlyn and it's, it's an it's an interesting point that you make about um you know something as simple as like holding the instrument because of course last week when we were talking about singing online one of the things that was, uh, came up was vocal health and potentially if you're singing into a screen that can't be good uh, well it, it can be a problem rather um, but Ashling, has that been a challenge for you um, to deal? Perhaps, you know, there, there is a, a lot of ideas in the research which has been circulating in 2020 so far about, you know, addressing remedial technical issues online can be, can be more complicated. Can you comment on that? Some of it is and some of it isn't. I mean, I think most people are quite adept these days at being able to fit the flute into the screen. I think when we started back in March, you know, like a lot of people were chopping off the whole right hand side and I couldn't really see what they're doing. But in saying that, I think because um, I have a lot of experience, I tend to hear things more than see them anyway. So I can I can hear what the fingers are doing, even if I'm not physically as close to see them. Um, I don't know how I would manage if I was relatively new to teaching. I have to say, I think I would struggle a little bit more being able mm. to pick up on, on the subtlety. So I think that's that's okay generally i think the challenge i find is that people are trying to accommodate this screen in their playing and and their awareness they can't really read what i'm thinking and most of us like to get a sense of what somebody is thinking or doing when they're playing so i, I find a lot of people are adjusting their posture to to have that as part of the lesson space um and possibly also because we're using technology a bit more, which is, you know, a good thing in many ways. But a lot of people are reading the music off their screens or they're sitting down because of the height that it's at. I mean, I know that often I'm, I'm sitting down to teach because of the height of my desk. But every time I want to show somebody about breathing and posture in the right way, I'm having to kind of scramble around the room to do that. And that's not that's not necessarily the best system. And I, I think some of my students are, are playing in slightly funny angles. And that's that's a harder thing to gauge when you're not in the room with mm. them so there are definitely some challenges um mm -hmm. and just on a really basic level like obviously everybody has variable levels of um equipment you know and that's some you know some people have been able to invest in better things and some people haven't so you, you do get challenges with that as well you mm. know eva um, you have a very uh, unique contribution to this conversation because you as i said you're a, a musician and a medic um, what, what do you think the associated uh, the risks associated with flute playing are, in your opinion? Yeah, so I can obviously understand that, you know, once you start talking about flutes, wind instruments, brass instruments, singing, the initial thing that anyone's going to think, no matter what level they, of knowledge they have about instruments and music, is that there's going to be a lot of air involved and there's going to be probably some saliva involved and it's all that all is something that has been a big kind of issue regarding the whole pandemic you know we're wearing masks constantly that's the one big thing that people are very conscious about and I think it's something that is very hard for the public to kind of get an idea of with there not being you know there's a lot of research coming out but without a lot of kind of research dating back on that it means there's no kind of firm grasp of what really are the exact issues with it 
so I think it's it's frustrating because you know I've seen some of my friends going back to different activities of sports in, in particular and I know some people are doing things inside and um so like swimming I know people who are going swimming and it's it's great that they can go back and do that but it kind of feels a bit <laughs> upsetting for me because I'm sitting there like I can't really play in a room with one other person even if I was at complete opposite ends eight meters away um you know so I think that's something quite hard to to have to deal with especially because on top of all that as as a medical student but even just as a student in general I am thinking that I don't want to infect my friends people I'm coming into contact with you know in the university and I don't want to pose a risk to them by what I'm doing so I think that I think it's just about kind of being a bit innovative like it's not great but if it means that in the future we're going to have to stand in the freezing cold for even even 15 minutes play a duet through you know um do something at least just to be able to see people and you know whether or not it ends up being screens being put up between people playing back to back which I think honestly you know there's definitely going to be some fun music that comes out of that so um I think I think it's all about being innovative and Thankfully, at least musicians are, you know, the most creative group of people that you could could ask to have to think up solutions. So that is a perfect lead um, to to now discuss with John. John, as you're as in your role as convener of um, Music Education Partnership Group, you've commissioned some research, which I think might have touched on upon, upon a point that Eva just made. Mute, John. Yes, uh, much of what uh, Eva was was saying has 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 struck a chord. From there's a trumpet quartet by Maurizio Cago, where the four players start playing all back to back, you know, and it's just something that people have thought. And it is possible to do that because uh, the thing about ensemble playing isn't hearing; it's like almost feeling. And it's like having a conversation with another person. You anticipate all the time what they're going to say, so you can get the word in edgeways. And it's the very same uh, in, in in music. It's this latency thing will probably never work because we're always anticipating, unless Jonathan tells us later about this logarithm that he's invented that will anticipate the rhythms that we're going to play next. But uh, the 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 science is is developing. Uh, all, all, all the time, but we're, we're, we're learning. Uh, we're learning more. Just this afternoon, I'm going to get the the first copy of a following the science thing that we've put together from about 300 articles. But recently, we put together this this research led by Leo Moscardini and Andrew Ray through the Music Education Partnership Group, which was uh, about online teaching, really. We make music online, and we came up with uh, some, you know, uh, very uh, commonplace results that you would once you hear them, you think, oh yes, that makes sense. Uh, the first thing that we came up with was that the great majority of teachers were skeptical about online teaching before the pandemic, and we all know that, you know, none of us thought it was much, much good. Uh, but then the next thing, <laughs> the great majority of teachers were agreeably surprised by how effective it was and then teachers you know like Ashley has just described us teachers had to think deeply about online pedagogy and lesson planning before they went into one of these online situations and like Eva's just said many pupils showed encouraging process despite having only uh, online lessons. And the things that uh, occurred to most teachers as well, that the parents were more engaged because they were going into living rooms and, 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 so, uh, and so on, the, par the parents were there and they got very engaged, so much so that some of the parents wanted to take up uh, instruments themselves. And the other things were a little bit more tragic than that. You know, in Scotland, we're great at whipping ourselves and it was a great opportunity to whip ourselves because uh, despite having a national online 
education platform called GLOW, which had been set up in 2007, local authorities were very loath to use it uh, in instrumental uh, teaching. And they ceased teaching, citing safety, uh, safety concerns and child, child protection. By contrast, uh, third sector organizations, private teachers and private schools sorted out the safety issues overnight and put everything online almost straight away. Uh, that includes organizations like the National Youth Choirs of Scotland, who with <laughs> Lucinda Geegan are doing stellar things and with Sistema Scotland as well. And local authorities such as the Western Isles, Highland, Shetland and Orkney with a lot of video conferencing experience before they just got on with it. Now the overriding sort of philosophical finding was like the heroism of the individual music teacher who supported their students through thick and then there seems to be this bond between the music teacher and the music stu student, which is very, very, very strong. And uh, they, uh, Leo Moscardini made this point in his summing up of the thing, they, they, they are the new policy makers, what uh, Michael Lipsky in 1980 described as street level bureaucrats. So this is going to be uh, very, very important in, in the future is the sort of the, the number of resources and the resilience that the online, um, uh, the online platforms uh, give us, you know, when we're into about, uh, you know, 15th virus by the end of the 20, 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be optimistic. Just to be optimistic. <laughs> always, always so. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting all those those findings and and the idea about you know um, street bureaucrats of 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 um, the people on the ground having to find quick solutions. Alan, you are involved in many a quick solutions. You are, you know, your your area of work is is, is music outreach of taking music to people. Um, in, in participation, in participation, in engagement. Um, so, um, tell us about what you've been doing with with and how your work has changed. Okay, thanks, Pete. So, um, yeah, like John just said, I, I did my first online workshop. I think the week of lockdown uh, back in March, and I have done a huge variety of things since then, both in my role for the university. And also um, for the sound, sound Festival in Aberdeen Sound, I uh, also do their learning and outreach programme too. So I've got a couple of examples of projects to share with you. And then I, I thought I would finish off with some tips um, about things that I now have learnt um, uh, because I have learned a huge amount in the last six months. And also I should just say that I'm speaking from the point of view of organising participative workshop events online that involve quite a lot of people, some a lot of people, some less so, but they're not in the one-to-one -one teaching situation like uh, Ashling and Eva have talked about, and neither are they sort of re necessarily rehearsals of like a small group of musicians. So at the University of St Andrews, we were about to embark on a wonderful five-year programme called STAMP, St Andrews Music Participation, uh, which was engaging local school children and young people, connecting them to brass bands, of which there is a very rich tradition in Fife, uh, and um, connecting them all together. And uh, I should also say that Bede and John are heavily involved in this programme. I've been given the honour of talking about it in this event, and really, they should also be talking about it. When we cancelled everything, we just, I think a fundamental important thing to say, actually, about your planning is we are hopefully gonna come out of this lockdown. And whilst the world is your oyster when you're working digitally and online, you've got to come back to where you originally stand. So I think reach out globally, but also think about your local community. And we were very conscious of doing that with, with the stamp program. We, we, you know, our program was for people close to where we live and bands close to where we live. So we, uh, Bede and John concocted this amazing stamp brass camp which was a three week online event in July, uh, three weeks of two hour sessions. They involve playing um, in groups and in smaller groups, uh, listening to renowned experts in the field um, and uh, having talks and things like that. But um, 
in an addition to that, so yeah, that was open to absolutely anyone across the globe. And we did have people from across the globe. We had participants coming from Brazil, China, across the USA, Europe, the UK, you know, it was far reaching. Um, but we also wanted to do what we had originally planned, which was engage local people in learning to play a brass instrument. And we had bought about 180 natural trumpets that were gathering dust in a cupboard. And we just thought, why not start uh, some of these young musicians off from scratch? Uh, Abid, I think this was your idea, maybe. <laughs> it was collective. <laughs> So what we decided to do was, instead of going through the schools, we put out a promoted post on Facebook, thinking we would get a handful of replies back. Uh, we did a, we spent a little bit of money on Facebook promotion, which reached over 60,000 people in our local area. It went totally nuts. Um, I had over 150 inquiries about the program. Um, nearly 100 people applied to take part, and we ended up with 76 young musicians learning to play a brass instrument from scratch. Now they were included in this stamp brass camp of which there were a further 188 participants. So we had quite a large volume of people. And with the 76 new starts, um, we had to get the trumpets to them. So the wonderful Denise Ward from Tullis Russell Mills Band labeled them all up and together her and I drove around in the height of lockdown. It was the most surreal experience, I have to say, delivered all these trumpets to people. Um, and they took part in the camp. They had an extra lesson before the camp. They took part in the camp and then they've had other, other lessons after the camp. Um, so that, that's been a really fascinating process, watching them learn from scratch online. And I'll talk a little bit in a, in a, in a second um, about that. But I think everything that John said about parental engagement and parents getting involved, like I feel like we really know their families, we know their dogs, we know their siblings as they come and join in their lessons every week. It is a really wonderful experience to get to know and engage with families in that way. I don't know if you want to say anything, John, quickly on that. No, it's, it's just fantastic. Every week before in one particular family, the wee sister is trying to pull the trumpet away from the elder brother who's having the lesson. It happens every week and it's so charming, isn't it? <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's been really wonderful. Um, I'll just very briefly, in contrast to that, uh, for work in sound in Aberdeen, um, I've been doing a lot of composition workshops and comp composing online. Again, something you might think you wouldn't be able to do. And my workshops have ranged from lasting three hours to three days. They've involved everybody online. They've involved um, composers liaising with school kids in the classroom. They've involved composing for yourself, composing for groups elsewhere. So there's lots of different ways um, uh, sort of of doing this. So if I've got time, Bede, I thought I would just very quickly run through some hints and tips about how to run. And I should also say, most of these events are on Zoom. We've done pretty much everything on Zoom apart from a, a Google Meet. Um, so as um, Ashing's already said, plan your content really carefully, like plan what you're gonna do, give it a, as much attention as you would an actual in-person event. Get to know your delivery platform really, really well. Be slick on what you're using. Uh, get to know its functionality and rehearse. So if you're going to do a big event like we did for the Brass Stamp Camp, we had all the presenters, I think a couple of days before the first event is we had a rehearsal. We had everyone online. What did it all sound like? So I can't, I can't stress enough how you should do that. Um, do as much of your pre-settings as you can and use the settings on the platform to help you, such as breakout rooms, the recording function, um, you're disabling private chat, all, all that sort of thing. Um, if you're working with a large group of people, don't assume that your audience or attendees or your participants are as good at using your platform as you are because you're really slick at it because you've done all your work. So we spent a fair amount of time writing a guide for participants about how to participate. And again, as has already been talked about here, preparing your space and whether you stand up or sit down, do you read off a music stand or do you sh screen share and how does that affect your posture and your, your playing? Um, uh, so I think preparation for you and for your group of participants is, is, is really important. Um, some of the things that we do for the music making activities, and I should say this has all come from Tony George, the fabulous tuba player in the Royce Collection who actually runs these trumpet lessons. Um, he uses a backing track for a lot of our lessons and the kids are on mute, but they can hear his backing track and they're joining in. And that for beginners is great because it makes them feel like they sound really good. And I'm learning <laughs> alongside the kids. So I can honestly say it just makes you sound better than you are. So don't underestimate the power of the backing track. Um, 
He does call and response again with a mute on. He does the call, everyone responds. Now you can't hear everyone else as a teacher, but everyone else is joining in. Then we come off mute and we do call and response, but he'll do the call and one person will respond and we'll go around the group or the group will do call and response with each other. Um, and that works really well because everyone's sort of uh, engaged in the activity. And another thing he might do is get people to play one line of music or one phrase and then the next person does the next phrase and then the next person does the next phrase. So you as a tutor can hear everybody. And if you mix everyone round, you might play the piece three or four times, but everyone will have played every single phrase and you will have heard them play the whole thing. And I think that's a really valuable way of allowing everyone to play, not together, but you can hear them um, individually. And then lastly, I'll just say really quickly, if you are doing a live large scale Zoom event, have a team of people working behind the scenes. Again, our stamp camp, we had about five of us. Somebody presented, somebody managed the chat, somebody dealt with the waiting room, somebody dealt with the breakout rooms. If you're doing large scale events, spread the work. That's probably enough. <laughs> Those are that's really really um, interesting to hear your your summary of all them back um, having having lived through it with you. But thank you for the clarity of your thoughts there, which I think will be greatly appreciated by by many. So in the brass camp, actually, um, we're we're now developing into what we're calling the stamp virtual conservatoire. I mean. Um, Alan, I know. I think uh, we're going to talk in just a, a moment about you know the potential future for. Um, uh, digital outreach, if we can call it that. Um, but uh, now, for now, John, could you maybe just talk a little bit about you know for how long you'd been you've been living with the idea of um, digital offer for uh, for, for, for music making? Because you've you've been thinking about this for a number of decades, I think. Oh yes, um, I was in exile in London, in forced exile you know, because it's the only place I could get any work uh, uh, until the, the late 90s was a very interesting time, you know, uh, digitally, because the Internet was fairly uh, new and it was being exploited, you know, and it was it was great to have the facility of emails and I'd always had all these little gadgets, digital gadgets, you know, sending faxes from Lagos and Nigeria when I was on tour and stuff like that. And I just loved gadgets. So when I came back to Scotland in 2002, it was just after the dot-com bubble had burst. And I'd been involved in a, in a dot-com startup, uh, which David Atherton had put together called Global music network and that was in 1998 when all of the opp enormous opportunities unleashed by the potential of the internet first began to be exploited of course it all it all <laughs> it all crashed with the but that that financial thing that went on there so when i came up uh, i was still had this idea in my head that this was going to be the future Philip Ledger, who had been the previous uh, principal at the, I, I had about seven months induction from him. And the most memorable one uh, was when he sat me down and he just said, listen, the future is going to be digital and it's going to be video conferencing and everything. And I want you to come tonight to this. This was in 2001, you know, to this thing we've got with the Eastman School tonight. And so it's between the different brass departments. We've got Jim Thompson over there and we've got Nigel Bodice and Brian Allen over here. And we're going to have uh, all of these students and we're going to have this interactive thing. And so I went to it and it was a little bit clunky, you know, and you needed to have uh, almost like a, a consultant, hospital consult consultant's bedside manner. You, I could see that it was different skills, but I was really, really impressed by that. And Philip said, listen, this is the future. This is what I advise you to go for. So I got together with a brilliant guy called Brian Beatty, who lives up on the Black Isle now. And then an equally brilliant guy called Ken Hay, who ran Screen Scotland for a while and then the Edinburgh Film Festival to develop these ideas. 
But unfortunately, it was a bridge too far for the RSMD and the RCS of the time. And but I'm just very, very surprised, you know, that, you know, that the human race has failed to take advantage of this thing that's so obviously staring them in the face. And by conservatoire, I don't really mean the high level thing. I mean, everything that we have, you know, uh, genetically to make us uh, creative through the, 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 through the performing arts at, at, every, at, 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 at every level. So it's for, it would be for beginners, and I, I see it for being more than music as well, but at, at the moment, maybe we should sort of uh, just confine ourselves to showing that it is possible in, in music. So I see it being the early learners starting up to the, you know, the, the real experts like Ashling and, and Eva doing the sort of incredibly high level creative stuff as well into composition, everything. Keep the human race creative through the virtual conservatoire. So there we are. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and, and the, the virtual conservatoire will launch on the eighth of November. Um, everyone will be in, in on on one Zoom call, all ages and abilities. Um, and if you're interested to come along and observe that, please, um, please, please do get in touch. Um, but Alan, do you think that you know? How do you think national companies, places like the Music Centre, are going to? Do, do you think our work has changed forever in terms of digital outreach and digital offer? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yes and no. I mean, I think we'll all agree, and I think last week's panel agreed, nothing will ever take away that ex live experience, and that needs to remain at the forefront of what we do and why we do it. But I think in Scotland, particularly um, in some of the MEPIC you know, meetings, we've, we've heard teachers say, actually, instead of getting in a car and driving for 45 minutes to the next lesson, it's actually easier or, or, or not all the time but you know it does make sense in certain respects to sit and do some lessons online with inter so I, I think in the future I suppose I think there'll be this blended learning where you know some people some weeks you'll have an online lesson and possibly other weeks you'll have um, you'll have an in-person lesson and I do think the climate change issue is something that will come into play with all of this. I mean, I know, as I said at the beginning of my section just there, we are engaging globally and certainly Sound Festival, we have hooked up some relationships that are that are international collaborations. We're never gonna get together. That's not our plan. We, we don't plan to meet when we all come out of this. We are doing a digital exploration online. And so how wonderful, how wonderful to have both actually. What an enriching, yeah. what an enriching thing to, I do think it will be a mixture. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's going to be very interesting to consider how in the future what we do is enabled by further in, improvements in the technology. And Jonathan, that's where where you come in. Jonathan, you have a, a, an enormous skill set, which I think is appreciated by everyone at the Music Centre. Um, you were certainly uh, uh, extremely important in the uh, in the brass camp. And um yeah, that video that you did of showing people how to make these virtual performances, I know has had many, many views. You seem to have the gift of being able to make um, difficult things and, and, and get them to make, make them make them simple. Um, so yeah, well, t tell us what you've been doing and uh, what you think the best parts of the technology currently are and, and how they might improve. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so um, essentially, uh, when lockdown hit, uh, I thought this was a good time to think about what could make life better for us musicians. Um, I was vaguely aware of online jamming software and such like, and had never used it. Uh, and this seemed like a good time to start. But also, um, you know, the easiest thing to do uh, to actually do something that's better than just zooming um, and, and playing music one at a time would be to combine people's recordings remotely into a final product. Uh, so I uh, am a fan of Reaper, the digital audio workstation software. So I um, started off uh, my kind of um, work within uh, 
lockdown inspired mode to uh, work on code to turn what Reaper had, which was taking a video or a grid of two by two videos. So you could have uh, four videos in a grid. Um, I wrote some code to make it so you could have any number of videos on the grid. And that's something which Reaper couldn't do before. Um, and then eventually that got included into Reaper. So today, if you download Reaper software, my code's built into it as a public domain contribution. Um, so that uh, we used uh, for you know, my Kaylee band, but also um, you know the St. Salvators Chapel Choir um, used that with Claire and as uh, Hopkins, uh, she um, you know helped her to get started using it, and then she was off doing it her, herself, uh, which was brilliant. Um, and uh, yeah, then there was um, you know various other people around the world have used it, so uh, I don't I can't keep track now. But I've made videos on how to use that uh, stuff as well and how to do the process. So they've had views on YouTube, as you said. Um, yeah, so that's um, something which you can do on the software. It's not the only way of doing it, but um, it's, it's a contribution. And uh, these videos are really helpful. Um, obviously, it's not the only way that people want to make music. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the online music, you've got several approaches to doing online music when you're socially isolated. So there's the call and response type thing or taking turns. Uh, there's the um, sing-along, uh, play-along approach uh, that we've heard about uh, from Ellen and others um, as well. And then uh, there's trying to play synchronously online without um, getting put off um, by latency issues. Uh, and there's different approaches to try to minimize latency that can help with that. Um, and then there's another approach, which is um, the only version I know that does this as something called Ninjam. With Ninjam, it's a bit of software for automatically adding delay so that you can play like a 12 bar blues or whatever. And everybody's listening to what everyone else did 12 bars ago, and it should be lined up. Um, so it's different, um, and you, but you are responding to people uh, and they're responding to you. It just takes 12 bars for things to kind of filter through or, you know, you can set how many bars, you can make it a jazz standard, you can make it uh, whatever. Um, so, but that's a kind of metronome approach essentially. So the, yeah, they're the kind of ways which are already uh, out there, um, different ways of working online. Um, the one which people are most excited about as a possibility is, of course, synchronous, where you can just pretend you're in the same room and play. And, uh, you know, the difficulty there, um, we're used to the speed of sound and being in the same room as someone. If you're in the same room, then one millisecond is equal to how long it takes sound to travel one foot. So if you think about a big orchestra or people are 20 foot apart, that's where things start to get a little bit uh, shaky in terms of timing if you've not got a conductor. If you're like 30 feet apart, it gets a little bit more complicated to synchronize because you've got 30 milliseconds of delay for sound to get from one person to the other person. So that's kind of the physical way to think about milliseconds. And uh, milliseconds are relevant for latency. When you use software, uh, you have usually if there's sound going over the internet or whatever, there's a certain amount of time delay uh, and that time delay is caused by Wi-Fi, it's caused by your drivers, uh, the computational power of your computer, uh, there's the speed at which things go through the various stages of the internet to get to the other end and at the other end there's all those steps again of latency involving uh, computer processing and sound card drivers and Wi-Fi potentially at the other end as well. So it all adds up and you end up with, you know, for this Zoom call, we, we might have uh, a latency of 100 milliseconds or something. And it's like we're 100 feet away, unable to, uh, you know. So let's do a little clap test, shall we? Let's go one, two, three, four, clap, 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 and do a, a bar of claps and see what happens. One, two, three, four, clap, 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 clap. clap. Okay, so yeah, all sorts of things going on. So we managed to sort of, uh, what came back to me uh, was people clapping about one clap 
behind, I think, and everyone sounded kind of in, but a but, uh, beast out. What was, what was it like for everyone else? Yeah. Syncopated. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it may have been um, all sorts of things being experienced in different ways by different people, depending on what their delay is for sound coming from different places. So, yeah, we end up with something very different and bad generally when we when we use something like Zoom. And uh, yeah, who knows, maybe in uh, 20 years time, uh, something like Zoom, uh, you know, commercial uh, user general software will probably have minimal latency for, you know, communicating nearby, but it's not there yet. At the moment, we really have to fight against the limits of the technology to get um, things working nicely. So what about the speed of light? Um, information can travel at the speed of light in the ideal world. And that means that if you make a sound here um, and it travels through, you know, if it gets digitized and turned into uh, a beam of light and sent down a light pipe, um, an optical fiber, and uh, it could get to New York in theory, if we had the light pipe, um, it could get to New York in 18 milliseconds or something, and we could jam with people in New York, no problem. Um, so that's something which might happen in our lifetime to as standard, but definitely not yet. Uh, so we have enough trouble getting 18 milliseconds, you know, within the same town at the moment, just because the internet is not designed for it uh, very well. Um, it's a kind of software for, for um, users doing general stuff, not worried about a little bit of time delay. So yeah, when you want to get the best out of latency and try to minimize latency, uh, Ethernet's important at the moment, getting a wired Ethernet connection and plugging that into a router um, or the wall in, in, a, in a building, the actual uh, network points and using wired Ethernet. That's a lot faster than uh, Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi, it's going through the air, but Wi-Fi takes a lot of processing time. It's not designed uh, to be fast. So you need uh, the, the first thing to do if you're wanting to get good Online jamming is to get wired Ethernet, um, and if you can't, then it's ruled out um, as a possibility at the moment um, to make it practical. Um, so yeah, wired Ethernet, and then you need to get um, a sound card or audio device, audio interface, which is going to be um, working well with a computer to give you a low latency um, as well and uh, a decent microphone and, and headphones. Headphones are very useful to prevent that echo thing that you often get um, with the sound coming out of the loudspeaker, going into the microphone and then going through the internet and the internet's the time delay that you hear in the echo. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then you need software that's going to send the audio out and receive audio and combine it. So there's various different bits of software including Jamkazam, which is a quite uh, user-friendly, relatively speaking. Um, it's not the easiest bit of software, but some of the alternatives are harder. Uh, so Jamkazam allows online jamming, assuming you've got good sound card and good wired ethernet. Um, and if you're in the same town or within 10 miles, it's going to be good. It depends on your internet connection as well. Um, then the sounds jack. Sound jacks uh, like Jamkazam in a lot of ways uh, allows this online jamming thing and it's uh, I've used both and got reasonable results uh, but yeah it's not it's not easy sometimes uh, you do have to have patience and uh, you you can have sessions where someone just drops out for no apparent reason and all that and uh, you know but it's better than nothing and we're working on it um, so what else is there? There's JackTrip, which is another bit of software, uh, which allows for using a command line, uh, or you know there may be newer versions where you can get JackTrip boxes. So there's various different uh, competing um, ways of doing this. Jamulus is another bit of software. And then there's Ninjam, which is the one I was mentioning, which has the sort of a number of bars of time delay built in. Uh, then there's Dante. Um, which is uh, dedicated within a local network. Uh, Dante is really great for online jamming. And so that's something you can do within a, within a single building. Um, and yeah, there's various different bits of software for, for a network audio, but Dante is the one we've got in the music center, uh, which works really well. Um, so yeah, there's all these different methods. 
essentially, yeah, in the music centre now, in the Laidlaw Music Centre, I've been helping set up uh, the um, computers and the network points and the Dante network. So right now, uh, you can switch on some things in three adjacent rooms, the recording room, the amplified music room and the live room. There's glass between those rooms and you can have the Dante sending the audio between the different rooms and everyone can hear everyone else and it's one millisecond latency. Um, so it feels like you're absolutely, uh, you know, the, the distance between you and the speakers is bigger than the delay in the sound due to electricity. So um, it's really exciting to, to jam under those circumstances. We've got more Dante devices. You can have them upstairs. You can have them in the medium rehearsal rooms. Uh, you can have them in the McPherson room and up in the organ gallery. Um, so we've got like 16 um, Dante uh, points and five Dante devices in the music center right now. So you can connect together five rooms in that really great quality way. Which is absolutely um, superb. And we're, and we're very grateful to everything that you've done to help us. And I'm looking forward to trying that tomorrow, actually. Um, but as a general principle, what would, you, what would your advice be to anyone listening in on this and maybe potentially putting it in, in the too hard basket? I think that um, one piece of advice that you gave me, it might have been tailored specifically for me, though perhaps more generic was perhaps just be a little patient. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely the case. Um, uh, the, uh, it's a general thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want uh, people to get the best out of uh, the technology, which is there, you know, the, the stuff we've got, we've got um, very lots of Ethernet points, so people can bring in their laptop, or whatever, plug it into the Ethernet. And if they've got a edgy room, if they've got wired edgy room set up on their computer, um, then they can plug it in. They can plug in a sound card USB. We've got uh, 10 of them, USB sound cards and microphones plugged in, spread about uh, the small practice rooms. Um, so people can come in and use the technology. They can make Zoom calls and use, use the USB sound quality and everything. Um, but yeah, with the actual um, Jam Kazam, it's uh, a way that we're recommending if you want to try jamming online, try Jam Kazam. You can use uh, multiple people in multiple rooms and jam together using that. It's not easy, but it is really worth it. Um, so Ian Howell, countertenor.com is a great place to look if you want to find out about what he's been up to with SoundsJack. He happens to be using SoundsJack rather than Jamkazam. They're similar things, but uh, I, I thought I might like I might quote from what he said on Facebook today. He said, schools that have not enabled their distributed students to make low latency music, yet that are offering an online only option, do so uh, offering a music degree with one of the core competencies requiring a musician learning how to communicate musically with other musicians. We can discuss how to make instrumental improvements. Uh, uh, I know the financial challenges and so on, but uh, I know that, uh, so if your tech department told you it isn't possible, they're wrong. If they told you it's hard, resource it. So that's kind of uh, what he is saying about it. We are, we're trying to get people competent as musicians. And one of the things you need to be able to do is play with musicians. One of the things we need for mental health is to play with musicians and to feel that we're getting feedback. Um, so I'm really uh, keen to do everything I can to help people learn how to use sound cards, how, how to use microphones, how to use uh, Ethernet, how to use Jam Kazam, how to use Nin Jam, you know, uh, uh, it's really uh, something that we need to enable people with. Um, we never know what's around the corner. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, this is a, really a question um, for, for us all, but um, uh, it does make me wonder whether our adaption of technology and potentially how much it is going to be a part of our musical lives, you know, in, in the near and the, and the um, medium and long term, um, whether we're kind of going to be developing a, a new mode of expression when we play, um, you know, uh, do, 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 we, do we have to be the same type of musician when we're in a space when the audience is there or does, does, do we think that, um, for example, uh, 
all my performances during April, May and June were involved a metronome. And it's really, really hard playing with a metronome. Um, you know, it makes you realize just how unrhythmic you are. But, you know, after three months of it, you got a little bit better. Um, I just wonder what other things are going to be happening to us as musicians as a result of all this technology. John, Ashling, any musings? Um, I suspect there will be a bit of rigidity because of the screen again and, and having to fit within something that has to be filmed, uh, less freedom of movement. And I also think that the way you express when you're in a room with actual people changes depending on how many people are there and what that room is, like how you play changes t like every time because of that how much space you leave between things, how you frame things in your piece. And, and that's all become a wee bit fixed. We're all in smaller spaces generally. Um, and, and there isn't that same sort of uh, feedback in the moment, that communication, which is, I think, like in performance, it is two way, even if it's between audience mm -hmm. and, and performer, it's, it is two way. You can feel things and, and you respond with what you're doing because of that. So I think it, it could, change it'll alter that you're, you're only sort of judging what you do based on your concept of how it feels and not by anybody else changing that mm. in, the, in the space um, one of the things that we considered last week was a, um, the development of a skill to almost project an audience being there and just a, a phrase which I, I i heard today actually just before i'm um, starting this this uh, talk with you all was the idea of uh, intimacy borders that you know the intimacy border um, I think that it can be many things but in the most practical sense it's the the, the gap between you and the audience and how do we deal with that as performers um, John you commented a little bit about this idea last week but do you have anything else that you might want to say about this idea of performers and audiences being remote um, yes well performers and audiences have been remote uh, for a long time I mean the mass audience because music you know since the stone age has been technology driven the development of musical instruments and the consumption of you know music uh, and so on and closer to our own times of course the advent of recording and broadcasting which far from sort of decreasing the numbers of people uh involved in music probably increased the numbers. In the 19th century, a lot of music was also domestic and in the home. You know, every aspiring middle-class family and even working-class family probably had a piano or a harmonium or something in the, in, in the house. And you can see that happening again. You know, the music industry association person that I listened to on our, on our music education council thing last week, just said that, uh, you know, sales of pianos and ukuleles and stringed instruments since the lockdown had just gone through the roof and music retailers were changing their practices, in fact, to deliver online rather than people coming into the shop. And they'd really got their, all their websites up uh, and, and running. And so I think the... And we're finding the intimacy of the education thing of actually going into the into the home and learning to use the 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 confines of the screen as well. It's something that you can come back from and go to. And if we had a session with John Miller explaining how he'd got his workstation sorted out to re to teach big parts of the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain, big sectionals and things, if he got it organized and lines so he could step back and come close to the screen and so on. So it's almost like you've got to become more of a film actor as well as a, as well as a teacher. And um, so um, I, I, I see this as being really, very exciting development. You cannot predict what the future is going to bring. You can have sort of certain assumptions about it, but when you think after the last pandemic, you know, that killed 25 or 54, I don't know, 
a lot of people, you know, Spanish flu. Then you had the, the jazz age after that. You had a new genre, which was largely uh, carried by, you know, through the, through the 78 recording and through broadcasting. Louis Armstrong, who was a big, the first big jazz soloist who came out from ensemble jazz and fronted uh, uh, bands, you know, his stuff was being sold in Socky Hall Street by 1927, 1928. It just went all over the world very quickly. And that's what will happen with the next new genre that comes out of these incredible, you know, technical leaps forward that Jonathan's describing at the moment. Mm. Um, we should probably bring this to a close and to, um, and to do so, I think I'll just um, telling everyone uh, who may be listening that on the 7th of November, we have a uh, live stream from the McPherson. There have been a number of live streams from the McPherson, which are all available on the Music in St. Andrews YouTube. But on the 7th of November, we have one in which Marcus Stockhausen is joining with the 50 children who have been learning through the Stamp Project online. Um, Marcus is going to be joining us from Germany uh, where he will be doing a live improvisation um, into the McPherson and then from the McPherson it will be live streamed out and uh, we're also going to be playing um, a, um, a trumpet quintet with him, an asynchronous piece. There is maybe another, a, another fifth um, uh, way of making music online is that is, that is deliberately taking um, the opportunity of um, you know, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous music. Um, so anyone uh, interested in uh, hearing more about that, um, please do tune in, tune in on the 7th. There are a number of laptops involved in the event, nearly, nearly the same number of laptops as there are uh, performers. Um, but thank you very much to, the, to, to all of you for listening and to the panellists for being with us. Um, I'm sure that in the, in the months to come, we will revisit this um, uh, topic again. But for now, um, see you later.